This podcast is sponsored by Nobody. Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming Susan Isaacs. Susan played John Candy's dead wife Marie in John Hughes' timeless holiday classic Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. She'll be my third guest from the movie, but first overall who was actually in the movie. And the funny part is, she... Oh, she's only in picture form. She has no lines, nothing. She's only seen in picture form. My other two guests, Deborah Lamb and Richard Hurd, they were cut from the movie. Thankfully, the footage was found and it's going to be on the new Blu-ray. But Susan's actually actually got to be in the final product, I should say, of the movie. And uh, she was also in another timeless comedy holiday classic, Scrooged. She was in the, the Wrong Guys, She's Out of Control, The War of the Roses. She guest starred on Seinfeld, Quantum Leap, Married with Children, lots of great stuff. She's also a writer, producer, director. Um, she's um, got a, a memoir out called Angry Conversations, which she had a one-woman stage show, Angry Conversations with God. And we're going to talk about all that stuff today. She was even in the Sunday main company of the Groundlings. I huh, wonder if she knows all the people I know from the Groundlings. We could only find out by asking. Today is um, Thursday, November 10th as I record this, but this will be out f- the week of Thanksgiving for some Thanksgiving holiday cheer. So yeah, here is my interview with Susan Isaacs. Hey Susan, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm pretty good. How are you? I am just spectacular. This is such a great honor. Thank you for taking the time today. Oh, you're very welcome. You're very welcome. So, going back in time, uh, did you gravitate toward acting early on in your childhood? Um, well, I was the youngest of four kids, so I had to shout to be seen and heard, so it became a natural thing, and, um... I sort of entertained my father by doing impersonations of classic movie actors that he liked. So that's how it started. And when I was quite young, I liked visual art. But when I got into high school, discovered uh, I discovered acting. And in the at the the high school where I grew up, mm-hmm. we were very connected to a regional theater. Uh, South Coast Repertory in Orange County, Mm -hmm. and we got really great connections with really great new theater, and um, and also my high school drama teacher, she was kind of uh, a genius and a second mom to me, really. Oh. She saved my life. Barbara Van Holt saved my life. I mean, she saved so many kids' lives that the city of Coast and Mesa... (laughs) <laughs> renamed March 15th Barbara Van Holt Day because she's just an amazing lady. And um, we did an original comedy show every spring, and that's where I really, that's where it really caught fire for me. Is that where you, dis- um, is I, that how you discovered improv comedy and stuff? Well, I, I discovered sketch comedy. Right. Now, I started at UC Irvine, which has a great theater department, but I hated it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Why did you hate it? Well, because it was all theory and walk around in the body of your character. And I had a teacher say to me, uh, you use your face too much. You need to use your whole body. <laughs> and I felt like, well, using my hands and flipping her off. It's just, it wasn't, you know, I... I didn't. I didn't really have the words language for it, but my kind of performance was more original comedy, and it took me a long time to find it. it took me a long time to find it. Um, so I transferred into the film department at UCLA. Mm-hmm. Um, I was in the film program at UCLA, and I kept getting cast in other people's movies. And I court, sort of laid laid out a fleece, like, "Okay, God, you know." It's, if this is the route I should go. I mean, I'm getting the screen film production, but if acting's a thing that opens up, then you really kind of got to give me a sign. And literally, a day later, my high school drama teacher called and said, hey, you remember that 
Youth Theater Director at Sasco Shrep. She's directing TV now, and um, you should get in touch with her. I was like, okay, cool. And then the day after that, my drama teacher called back and said, actually, she's directing an episode of Family Ties this week. Can you go to an audition? I was like, oh, yay. So, and I booked that job, and um, I was off to the races. Wow. Um, wow. That's, yeah. Well, you know, five years later, I'm like, you know, I, I, I need something more. And then that's when I later got, I tried stand-up, and then I got into improv comedy and sketch comedy and the groundlings. But that's, you know, I did, you know, have a miraculous door open for me into a very difficult world. But, you know, I did have my answer. Wow. And were you at, yeah. UC, were you at UCLA the same time as, like, Tim Robbins and his crew of actors? Mm-hmm. But they had made their mark, um, I forget the name of this theater company, but yeah, his kind of group. Shane Black was there at the same time, but Shane Black was anything. Shane Black was in the theater department, and Dana Stevens, mm-hmm. and then, then it ended up writing, and I was in the film department, and I ended up acting. Okay. Yeah, because he's, he's yeah. I've interviewed a lot of um, a lot of the, peop- the people that Tim Robbins came up with at UCLA, and they yeah. were in that theater group. Yeah. Yeah. The Actors Gang, that's what they were called. The Actors Gang, that's right. They have a, a tremendous uh, theater company that's, that's still active, Actors Gang. It's still going, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you... That's what I tell my students. Yeah. It's, it's like the, the people, the cohort that you meet and invest in here in college will become your community and can come, become your community um, and you can all help each other up. Uh, it's up to you what you invest in. But uh, I'm always encouraged when my graduates, have, you know, they form writers' rooms on their own and they continue to work. Oh yeah, that's that's always important. You know, writers' rooms. Yeah. yeah. So you you tried stand up, huh? Did you go to the comedy store? Um, I did a, a stand up class and I did really well, but it was like. Right when the Soviet Union was falling apart, and I was yeah. telling jokes about Tajikistan, yeah. and the guy, you know, the audience was like, "Show us your face." I was like, oh. ah, this is "Not for me." So then I tried improv, and I went to the Groundlings, and went through the school. Went through the school, got into the company pretty quick. Um, that was like back in the nineties when that could happen. <laughs> but I, uh, stand up is very uh, kind of a isolating, yeah. solipsistic endeavor. And there's a lot of lot of stand-up comics, and this is true of a lot of comedy, you know, they're yeah. bearing a lot of rage and, and trauma. And um, so I remember, because uh, I worked on a movie with Richard Belzer, and he was doing something at the comedy store, so I went to go see it. Right. And then I was thinking about, you know, doing it, and, and it was just, it just had such a dark vibe. I was, I was like, yeah, I don't like this. It's just, it's a really, it, it just, it's just kind of a, um, a, a, a bummer vibe. You have to really yeah. have a strong constitution to do it. I I, um, I did stand up for ten years in San Francisco, and like in the beginning. Oh my gosh! In the beginning. So you know what I mean? Yeah, in the beginning, I could not believe how miserable, dark, and emo comedians are when they're not performing. Oh, it was, it was emo. mind-boggling. Oh, emo. Yeah. <laughs> And and their way of like like you know if they think something's funny they're like that's funny damn it I should have thought of it yeah they're such so competitive and it's it's such a tough room it is such such a tough room I think these days people are coming up more in the spoken word yeah like the moth and things like that that have much more of a vibe of support mm-hmm. but I mean you know there's a reason Freddie mm-hmm. Prince you know ended his life. Um, yeah, it's just very, very, very. It, it's just such a, a real dark vibe, you know. And yeah. then around all that alcohol, it just becomes a recipe for for unhappiness. Absolutely, I, I think that uh, spoken word and one man performances, one person performances. Yeah. I think that's going to be the future of stand up yeah. once. Uh, more comedy clubs start closing and comedians get tired yeah. of the business. They're going to be entrepreneurs and do their own stage shows. Right. Um, well, that's what I ended up doing about, um, I wrote a memoir and right. that was published and I toured with a big New York Times 
best-selling author, and I, I started as a solo show, then I got the book deal, and then I eventually restaged the solo show a few years later as a full production, and that was my essentially stand-up. It was, you know, it was a like a, you know, like Eddie Izzard, and well, I think a lot of comedians are moving more that way of, of storytelling, but uh, yeah, it's... Um, I think that there's, I mean, there's all, um, my friend of mine married Jim Gaffigan, and she writes for him, and oh, yeah. we do shows together. And he's just, he's brilliant and hilarious. Yeah, the best. He's, he's, <laughs> oh, he's wonderful. Um, and he goes to the comedy club every night and works on his material. Right. He's one of the hardest working persons I know. But it, it, it's definitely, it's, it can be a real dark vibe. There's a lot of, there's a lot of sadness in the typical stand-up traditional stand-up act. Yeah, especially in Hollywood in those days. Oh, my God. It, like, there was a cocaine palace at the comedy store, pretty much. Okay. It was dark. Yeah, I think people were trying to find a way to lift their spirits and their anxiety and their self-loathing and all those other things that go along with it. So, so when you That's got... That's a really fun convo. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm, a, I'm a comedy nerd, so I love talking about this stuff. Yeah. So when you got to the Groundlings, like, who was there at that time? Um, well, I came up with Sherry O'Terry, Kristen mm. Chan, Will Ferrell was oh. left right behind me. Um, Molly Shannon didn't go to the Groundlings, but she worked this, at this little restaurant called Melon Roses yeah. down the street. And when we would go to Melon Roses to work, you know, just to work on material, she was like, hi, I got the show called Molly Show. Um, so th that was my era. Um, and I left, I, I just, I blitzed through the school really fast. I got in, into the Sunday company. I was just on this, you know, blitzkrieg and I burned out and I was like, I'm going to take time off. And I got into USC film school, you mm -hmm. know, for screenwriting. So I was like, right. I'm going to go to film school for a couple of years and then come back. And by the time I finished, um, I was, I, I, re I really realized how exhausted the groundlings had made me. So I never went back, which I regret. Um, you know, because like six months after I left to go spend money at USC, you know, Will and uh, Sherry and Kristen was up on SNL. I'm like, well, oh, boy, I'm just full of good decisions today. So you didn't get to audition for Saturday Night Live? No, because I left. And I remember um, Tony Sepulveda, who was in the main company, he's like, don't leave. This is going to be your ticket. I'm like, no, I'm going to go right hit the... You know, I'm going to go write full-length screenplay right now. <laughs> I'm, you know, that was my attitude. And, you know, so I left to go to grad school um, and never auditioned for SNL. But, like, my friend McNally Seagal was always up for it. I think she auditioned for them six times. More recently, mm. my friend David Magadoff, he auditioned for them about four or five times and wow. was always on the edge, never got it. But he just, um, he was on this last season of Dexter and his career is really checking off and he's doing his own thing and he mm. does improv groups and has a, I guess, podcast kind of thing. So he, he found his way. But yeah, it's, um, you know, when someone makes it, it it's, quite, it's quite a feat to, to get that far. Yeah, a guy I came up with in stand-up in the Bay Area, uh, Chris Garcia, he auditioned in 2016, oh. and he got to go to New York and audition for Lauren, and it didn't happen, unfortunately, but he's a very funny guy. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's really, it's really, um, you see those, and then, and then when you're on the show, there's this pressure of, like, you have got, mm -hmm. come up with characters, you start on Monday, you got to write a sketch, and it's going up that week. It is a, it is a juggernaut. Yeah, um, it's a lot of pressure. I, I teach at Chapman, um, in the school <coughs> at Chapman University, and one of my colleagues, Barry Blaustein, I mean, he uh, was an SNL writer. He wrote, um, you know, all of Eddie Murphy's stuff. He went on and wrote Coming to America just uh, last year. He went back and he, he wrote a sketch trick because Eddie did a guest spot and got an Emmy. But, you know, he would just talk about it. It was just really, really high stress. You know, it is high stress. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Was uh, one of your teachers at the Groundling Cynthia Zaghetti? No. You know, right when I got out of uh, UCLA, I did... 
someone said you should go to the ground and audition and I auditioned. I was like twenty two and I auditioned for Cynthia Spaghetti and she's like, Oh, you can go into the basic class and I chickened out. I chickened out. But I did end up taking um a UCLA extension class with her uh, a few years later and then it was that that she encouraged me to go back to the ground lake. Mm-hmm. So I went I went back in like ninety one, ninety two. Wow. Yeah, because I've, I've talked to all her friends uh, from the Groundlings. They've become my friends, and they just tell me how great she was, and, you know, she was tough oh, as yeah. nails, you know, and she passed just before I started my podcast. Her and I would have had a great uh, conversation, I think. Yeah. She was, she was a legend. Uh, my favorite teacher and director there was Mindy Sterling. Oh, yeah, I know Mindy. She, <laughs> Yeah, I read this book recently. It's a great read. Oh, I didn't know. He had a memoir out. Yeah, it came out very quietly, apparently, because I've mentioned it to a lot of people, and they didn't know it. Yeah, oh, my God. He 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 has been through some shit, I'll tell you. And it, yeah. I recommend it. It's a great book. You'll find out how A Night at the Roxbury got made. It's very shocking. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to spoil it. When you were, Oh, when you were at Chapman, did you know Ann Beats? Yes. Well, we we had, um, you know, met on Zoom, but, um, yeah. you know, by the time that I was full-time, we were in lockdown, and then she passed suddenly. Yeah, I'm one of the last people to interview her. She was great. Well, yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, that conversation ended early because uh, whoever was in the house with her lured her away, but we had a great talk for the whole yeah. for the whole time, though. It was, it was wonderful. One of my highlights, yeah. I have to say. Yeah. So you mentioned... Yeah, we've got, go ahead. We've got another um, a, an SNL writer, Hugh Fink. Oh, I know Hugh. Teaching our sketch comedy. Yeah. Yeah. Teaching our sketch comedy and stand-up classes at Chapman. Yeah, he was great. He's a good storyteller. So you mentioned uh, for, before about family ties. How was that experience? Mm-hmm. You know, I think I was spoiled because I was like, oh, I'm going to go on an audition. And I was still at UCLA. It was, I was still a senior uh, at UCLA when it happened. Mm-hmm. And a guy that I knew um, who was in the grad program had got an internship with and started to work for Jim Brooks. And so I went to the Paramount lot and I had this audition. And he's like, oh, poor honey. You're, you're. And then I was like, oh, yeah, actually, I got it. And I, they were so nice. Um, I was working with Lee Shallot. Uh, she's gone on to be a... a very successful uh, television director, mm-hmm. um, and um, Ken Hecht uh, was one of the writers on the show, and he was, I would call him up, and he would give me a pass on the lot, and I would go talk to him, you know, I, I, I went and had meetings with him, because I told him, you know, I was still at UCLA, you know, getting my degree, and he would just, like, come and invite me to his office, just, just like, he just wanted to mentor me, mm-hmm. and he passed away not long after that, but, like, what a mensch, and... Um, uh, Michael J. Fox was a sweetheart. I think I was on the lot like a year and a half later. He's like, hey, what are you doing? You know, like, he told, you know, the people, it's really interesting. There's sort of the adage, if mommy's happy, <coughs> mommy ain't happy, and nobody happy, that mm-hmm. the, the vibe of the person in charge 
sets the tone and makes it either a wonderful place to be or a horrible place to be. Of course. And the people at Family Ties were, were incredible and yeah. kind and generous and fantastic. One of my earliest interviews, uh, Kathleen Wilhoit, she was in that episode as well. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, she's a character. Oh, my God, she is a force of nature. Yeah. I love her. <laughs> well, she had obviously been at it longer than I had. I don't know. I think maybe she didn't go to college. She started acting. And she came yeah. on. She was, like, that's the kind of character I would always play, the forceful character like that. So this was my very first job ever, and I was, like, the shy, quiet person on the set. And she, yeah, she, uh, she has such a strong sense of herself. I, mm -hmm. I, I immediately admired her so much. Yeah, talented singer too. Yeah, yeah. Lenora, Lenora May, she was in that episode. She's talented as well. Mm -hmm. Do you remember um, guest starring on the short-lived series Other World? I do. That was <laughs> so much fun, and I forget. Brian Falconer, the guy, well, he went by the name Falconer because he also had a band. Mm -hmm. um, he was a huge Beatles fan, and in this, they had gone to this world and introduced mm -hmm. Beatles music to, to And I think that's why when I went into the audition, I was like, oh my God, what songs are you going to use? And, you know, I was like, mm -hmm. you know, I remember I was like, I need it for somewhere else. It's a short time. But um, that was a, a, that's too bad that series didn't go anywhere. Yeah, it's funny. I, it's funny because at that time, sci-fi movies were doing huge business at the box office, and then TV yeah. was trying to jump on the bandwagon, and every sci-fi series in the 80s failed. There was V, yeah. Misfits of Science, Max Headroom, uh, so many. Mm -hmm. Like, it's it's crazy how they didn't do well on TV back then. And the original Battlestar Galactica was only on for, I think, one or two seasons, and it became a massive hit when they re, you know, they re it in the early aughts. That was yeah. That was exactly. post Star Wars. Yeah, because after Star Wars hit, there was uh, the, yeah. the the Logan's Run series. There was Battlestar. There yeah. was um, uh, there was the Flash Gordon movie that didn't do well. Everyone was trying to do Star Wars for a while, and mm -hmm. then and then these weird like sci fi shows came out and like they all failed. It's really it's really interesting. Yeah, yeah. So how do you get to be Dell's um, dead wife in planes, trains, and automobiles? Well, this is really fun. Um, <laughs> get, oh, uh, Jane Jenkins and uh, Janet Hershenson were casting the movie Labyrinth. And this I had just started, and I didn't know better than to be afraid. Mm -hmm. So I literally, I sent them my photo, and I called and said, hey, I, I, re I should audition for that. And they're like, who is this? I'm like, yeah, this is nice. I'm taking my picture. And they were like, um, I admire your chutzpah. So I went in and had a general with them, and obviously it was the part of Jennifer Connelly. You know, I, I was wrong for it, but they just wow. really took a good time to me. And I auditioned for a lot of things. They put me up for a lot of things. And the funny thing about playing trains and automobiles is I was only just supposed to be a photo, but I was going to be a series of photos in his wallet. And I basically, Janet and Jane liked me, and they gave my headshot to... Um, John Hughes, and so they cast me, and so it was basically um, um, just like they were setting up like it was one of these, like, 1959 or whatever the era was supposed to be, um, like a high school portrait, which mm -hmm. is the photo that you see, um, and then nice <coughs> makeup and hair, and <coughs> nice, like, uh, you know, legendary, you know, started from makeup lines, mm -hmm. um, and, and that's all it was. And then they were going to then, you know, do another series of photos because originally when um, Del's on the plane, he's going to open up his wallet and he has a shower curtain and do kind of this whole series of photos. Right. But during the production, I kept sending like fake letters and postcards to Del from Marie like, you know, are you getting an STD, darling? You know, like, <laughs> like silly things. And John Hughes loved it. And so he's like, we're going to, I'm going to bring you back and we're going to get everything he's shot in the can, and it was literally at the very end of production, they're on a tight schedule, and he brought me in, and they, they were actually filming Lila Robbins and uh, Steve Martin on one side of the soundstage while they had, John, uh, you know, like, they were filming over there, and then we would wait, and when they had to cut to a reset, then John would run to the other side, and mm -hmm. it was uh, John Candy and me. We basically just filmed two completely improvised Thanksgiving dinners. Wow. And I was, I was 
you know, I think I had only been professionally acting for a little over a year. I was so intimidated. And John um, Candy made me feel like a million bucks. Oh. You know, we had all this time to wait while, you know, uh, Steve Martin and Lila were on the other side. He's like, come on, we get in his trailer. We, we, he, we, we played Trivial Pursuit. People came in and hung out. He was so gregarious and so, like, such a such an open-hearted person. Yeah. Um, if, it, if it had been somebody else, like, I mean, like, I know Steve Martin's very quiet, and, I mean, I don't think I would have done that, you know. But he was just like, hey, you know, basically, you're invited to the party. Yeah. Um, and my scenes were actually in the movie until, like, late in the summer. I was supposed to do ADR for um, the scenes. Um, and I was in Colorado, and then they didn't reschedule it, and then I went to the um, premiere, and my things were cut. Oh. It was really, it was, it was traumatic. Well, you're in there in picture form, so at least that counts. <laughs> in the picture, I know, in the very famous Those Are Pillow scene, so I feel pretty, pretty lucky. And I got to improvise with John Candy. And I also worked with him on another movie. Um, delirious. Gosh, okay. Yeah, Delirious. He was just the sweetest guy. He was just, he was a mensch. Yeah. And it just pisses me off that he didn't, you know, there are horrible gargoyles of human beings in our public sphere and whatever who you just wonder why God allows them to breathe. And right. we lose someone like John Candy. Yeah. Okay. I've talked to two people yeah. who were cut from the movie, but you were actually, you were cut, but you were still showed up in picture form. That's so ironic. I know. Yeah. yeah, they came out with a, a new Blu-ray, and that the, the the cut footage of my two other guests, Richard Hurd and Deborah Lamb, they end up on the Blu-ray, and and uh, yeah, you know, Richard. They did. Yeah, uh, Richard's no longer with us, but Deborah, she's really happy about it. So she, because when I first talked to her in 2017, she was like, "God, I hope someday I get to see that footage," and now she has. So. Yeah. I'm really bummed that they didn't put our stuff in there. Oh, I, I don't know if it, if it is or not. I haven't even got the new Blu-ray yet, but I'll let you know, or you can get a copy. I don't know, but like, yeah. But I know that I know their footage is in there. I heard. Uh, yeah, I think if I had, if, when did it come out? Uh, just recently, like this year or something. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'll have to check. Probably not, but you never know. I mean, it was one of those things where I kept trying to get the the stuff to have on the reel, and it was like Paramount was like, nope. Yeah. It's not going out. What, what did you think, though, when you saw the movie? Well, I was obviously completely traumatized because I was supposed to be in it. Right. Um, um, and it was, uh, you know, I had a lot of close calls like that where it was cast as a, a recording role on a show that the, the next day the show got canceled. Oh, boy. Um, a lot of things like that. You know, leaving the ground things early, blah, 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 a lot of stuff like that. But when I look at planes, trains, and automobiles, I feel like the place where the reveal was supposed to be was like after Dell leaves and he's like, I haven't been home in years. Um, either that or they might have gone to it when they were in the, um, you know, drinking those little miniatures in the motel going into the any words to describe me. Yeah. I don't know. If, I think it was one of those two places. And I think if it were in, mm -hmm. it would have spoiled the mystery. Mm -hmm. um, and if it had been, because in, in, in the moment when Steve Martin realizes that, you know, his, you know, the, the story, he, he just got a rush. I mean, I teach screenwriting, um, and it would, it would have slowed down the story completely. So it was right to cut it. Um, I'm just sad that we lost John Hughes before he had a chance to do a director's cut. Yeah, that's... I'll put it back in there as an Easter egg, because that would have been fun to see it. Would have been fun. It would have, yeah. It's sad that he didn't get to do that. Uh, like but the movie, I just um, think it's one of it's one of his absolute best because you know he's coming off of the teen yeah. movies and he was doing something more adult oriented and just he was able to just combine you know hilarious comedy with pathos and and great drama, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, you know, and I crack that's up. Why it's, that's why it lasts. That's why it has lasted. He went to that emotional core. Which, I mean, I have a couple of uh, senior thesis scripts right now that they want to do it comedically. I'm like, yeah, but you still have to establish, like, what is this character want? What's their wound? 
what do they want more than anything else in the world? But what do they actually need? And, and if you do not hook us emotionally, you can pile joke after joke, but unless there's a core to it, it's not, you know, it's not going to get, it might get made. I don't know, you certainly see movies that seem completely forgettable. But it is so important to give us, like, why are we going to care? Why are you going to root for this person? Why am I going to, like, lean forward and worry about them? And, like, that moment when he just goes off them and, and he's like, well, I like me. My wife likes me. I yeah. mean, that, is just, that, that he just had the balls to do it. I mean, Steve Martin is just hilarious. I mean, you feel bad for Candy, but he is just hilarious going off on him saying, did you notice on the plane that when I started reading the vomit bag that I didn't want to talk to you? It is hilarious just the way he delivers right. that. Oh, oh, I know. And that's what makes it so perfect. The setup. Yeah. It's so hilarious. And even though he's mean-spirited, it's Steve Martin, and there's, a, you know, the... Under they set it up why he's so frustrated and when he has that the chatty Kathy it was like pulling the string uh, uh, uh. <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah. I've been with Del Griffin you know I just it's just it's, it's just so perfect and one of my actually this is probably one of my favorite movie log, um, lines of dialogue of any movie at all mm -hmm. it's when they're in the back of that truck and they're like what's the temperature one <laughs> That's you know, a great line. That, yeah. I mean, it's so, it is just perfect. One, That's perfect. Two, one, two, three, one, two, three. That's perfect. I love that line. Yeah. It's just genius, genius, genius. Do, yeah. do, you, do you get recognized for that movie a lot? I used to a lot. Mm -hmm. But uh, I remember, uh, this was like probably years ago. Mm -hmm. There was a sparkless water delivery guy who was delivering water to somebody in my apartment building. He's like, hey, you're Marie. And I was like, you're, you're John Candy's wife. I'm like, oh, my God. You know, and my, of course, like, I'm wearing this, like, hairstyle, like, straight from, like, beach blanket bingo. And my hair isn't anything like that. But he recognized my face. I'm starting to get, hey, you're the Jurassic lady. Uh, <laughs> I, I did a thing for Jurassic World the ride um, at all the Universal Studios tours in the world, there's uh, about nine, um, 90 minutes of scripted content that plays on these screens that it's supposed to be like a fake news news hour. And I'm like the Christian Amancourt of Jurassic World Network. So I am the <laughs> news anchor and I interview uh, um, B.D. B. B. Wong and Chris, you know, Chris Pratt and, and yeah, and fun, fun stuff. So, and and I have this British accent. Mm -hmm. So, which is really fun because the director was British, and when I went to the callback, he's like, "Oh, but you're British." I'm like, "No, actually, I'm not." Uh, so it was really fun because I even told him. Um, but so I'm starting to get, um, oh, you're a Jurassic lady. Nice, nice. So, it's not it's not like a worldwide movie. There's people who go to that, and occasionally I'll get Parks and Recreation, or rather. I'll have to do this. They'll have me for first semester, and the, and then they'll come back after you know Christmas break, and they're like, "I was watching Parks and Recreation," and because I had a little recurring on that, I I was in three episodes as the realtor. So sometimes I get that. So when you worked with uh, Candy again on Delirious, did, he remembered you, right? Well, we weren't in a scene together, but I saw him on the set. He's like, "Hey, yeah, he totally mm -hmm. remembered me." Nice. Uh, he was just, yeah, he was just such a dear. Yeah. People like that, like John Lithgow, just um, Drew Carey, Ryan Stiles, just some, um, just really menschy people. Mm. Uh, um, Jason Alexander, Julia Louis Dreyfus, just menschy, you know, menschy people. Yeah. Oh, another mensch you worked with that I've talked to, Danny Bilson, who directed The Wrong Guys. Oh! I love Danny! He's yeah. the best! Yeah. His daughter started getting famous. I was like, Yeah. Look, he's got to be Danny's daughter. Oh, Danny is terrific. I love him. Yeah. What was what was Belzer like to work with on that? Belzer's funny because he is that solipsistic stand up comedian. You know, mm -hmm. very dry, very in his own thing. It's funny. I remember mm -hmm. the first day we had for the shoot was the day of the Whittier Narrows earthquake. 
they were in a trailer, and all of a sudden it's more like, oh, oh, okay. And, you know, that's over. Um, but he, he really, he had a, like, he had a grudging respect for my com- comedy timing. Mm-hmm. And then, like, he, he was like, hey, I'm doing a show at the Improv, and come see me. So he was great about, you know, and, and then, like, years and years later, this was, like, 15 years later, yeah. I'm, I'm living in New York, and I'm at a restaurant, I'm like, there's Belzer, and I was like, hey, he's like, uh, oh, you know, he was a law and order, but, yeah, yeah this is like, hey, I totally know you, where do I know you from? So, he, you know, he is so much that character, like, the same as his character on Law and Order and, um, um, the Baltimore show that he did, but, um, lunch, but, mm-hmm. You know, props. He he gave props. He was he was great. I really liked him. Yeah, very. And I funny felt guy. like it was a win that I that I earned his respect too because he was a tough cookie. Yeah, and that punch was brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> then you were in another holiday favorite of mine, Scrooge. How was that experience? Scrooge. Well, that was really interesting because. Um, this was something, it's like before the roses, I got it on the recommendation of the casting director, David Rubin, mm-hmm. who's a huge champion of mine. And, um, um, the people in that scene are, uh, Bill Murray and Bill Murray's two brothers. Right. And the writer, Mitch Glazer. Right. And of the women, it's. Wendy Malick, who was married to Mitch at the time, mm-hmm. um, a friend of Lauren Schuler Donner, the daughter of a friend of Lauren Schuler Donner. And so they're basically, who can you get to just be here and do this? And um, um, the director asked, um, I'm blanking on his name now. Um, Richard Donner. He asked, Dick, yeah, Richard Donner. Dick Donner's like, who do you know is improv? It's like Susan. Yeah. So I feel like I was like this odd man out with all these royalty. But... Joel, I was paired with um, Joel, his brother Joel, and Joel's hilarious. Joel's an amazing actor, and we had a lot of fun. Yeah. Well, I watch it, and I feel like, oh, my God, my face, I mean, my facial expressions are way too big. You know, of course, we're always our worst critic. I'm like, I got my mouth gaping open. I feel like <laughs> my jaw became unhinged. I'm like, oh, my God, I can't watch that. But it was really fun. Yeah. Really, really fun. It was really fun. It's funny. I told... Um, Barry Glossian, who wrote Coming to America, because that was filming on the lot at the same time. Right. And the people on that set and, you know, people on our set, like, they all knew each other. Um, but just, I remember when um, Bill Murray walked into the trailer, he was, like, literally uh, almost two heads taller than everybody else. <laughs> and he, he reminds me of Michael Richard in that they're really, really tall. they not spectrum, but such a comic genius that they're on their own level. Like, yeah. uh, geographically, you know, um, their altitude, uh, but also just the way, and you, someone does improv, like, like, no, like, doing improv all those years, like Ryan Stiles. Ryan Stiles' mind has been honed to see the connections and jump from the connections one to the other, and it is so hard to keep up with something like that. Right. Because when you're good at improv and you do it, your mind... It's just you, it's like a connection super highway. And that's what I felt like with Michael Richard and, um, and Bill Murray. He was just, he was on another plane. Just a genius. An absolute genius. Yeah. And I, I think John Murray is, is hilarious. He should have been just as big as Bill. Uh, he did a movie a couple of years before that called Moving Violations, and he is hilarious. I mean, he got a lot of flack from it because they thought he was just imitating his brother, which he kind of is, but I don't know. His his mind was, was I think, sharper than Bill's. That's just my opinion. Well, and I also think, um, I, I think the issue is that um, well, he had to play a straight man. Yeah. You know, that role, if you look at that role in A Christmas Carol, it's just a guy who's like, I'm always going to invite him. And and um, of the scenes that he had, he also had to play the straight man, had to play the pathos of, like, in the, in the you know, Ghost of Christmas Future and seeing it. So he didn't have as much. And whereas Joel just came in and, and blonde in and is a great comedic actor and delivery, and, and Joel's had a great career. He had a great, had a really interesting uh, dramatic um role recurring in uh, Mad Men, too, Joel did. But yeah, I think John, you know, 
in the sense that he had he had that other stuff, but then he was he was stuck in a position of being a straight man. Right, right. Yeah. How about doing the she's out of control? Oh, that was hilarious. Well, Sandra Godey directed that, and mm-hmm. he cast me in a commercial where it was all these valley girls. It was for Midas Muffler, and they were in a loud car, and they get buried in an avalanche. Mm-hmm. And Sandra just really liked me and this other girl named Laura Summer. And oh, I know Laura. We invited, <laughs> yeah. Well, Laura, well, so Laura and I invited, we were invited to audition for that, and mm-hmm. I was getting my hair, my hairstylist was down on Venice Beach where it was all like, you know, dreadlocks, you know, just crazy, crazy um, hair. And so I actually went down to my hairstylist, or I got up at 7 in the morning, and she crimped my hair and gave me this, like, kind of uh, Cindy Lauper look, where yeah. it was just this terrible crimping, and I wore this crazy clothes. And literally we got and then Stan loved the outfit, so then... In that movie, both uh, Laura and I are like, that hair was inspired by my hairstylist, you know? Yeah. So that was really fun. But I worked with Stan, um, I worked with Stan um, on, a, on a Midas Muffler commercial. It was supposed to be huge, and they put all this money in it, and then it barely played it off. You know, those things your car- that your your uh, agent says, this is going to be a national network, it's going to run forever, you're going to, you know, pay for your kids' college tuition on that. And then it's like, ooh, didn't happen. I love the I I love the movie. You know, Wally Shawn's a psychiatrist, and he says that boys think about sex six hundred and forty nine times a day. <laughs> oh, I, Wally Shawn is he's just so terrific. Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, you just look at him, you it start so laughing. Cool. Mickey Dolan's daughter. I was like, what? Yeah, okay. uh, Amy Dolan's. I interviewed um, her. I interviewed her aunt. Um, Coco Dolan's last year, actually on this day, I got a reminder that I talked to her a year ago on on Facebook today. I was like, God, I can't believe it's been a year already. Isn't it nuts? It, the older you get, the, I mean, it really is Einstein's law of relativity that time, time speeds up. It's unreal to me. It does. Unbelievable. It tick, tick, ticks away. How about uh, the War of the Roses? That was really, really fun. So, David Rubin, again, um, it was just a small role. There weren't any lines, but they wanted someone in there to do something. And um, uh, David, I just had an appointment where I went in to talk to um, Danny. Mm -hmm. And I got into this intense conversation. I had this, oh, I had this um, day planner that had all these... uh, art pieces from, there was a big expression, um, impressionist exhibit at, at the L.A. County Museum of Art, and it had Monet's, um, Monet's haystacks. And I just got, I was like, oh my God, no, you have to see this. And there was this one, and I just, and there was this another photo I couldn't find. I was totally frustrated. So I literally just talked to Danny mm. for like a half hour about other stuff, and I got the part. And so then... You know, I didn't have any lines, but it was just our reactions as the two of them were, you know, bidding for the Chimunk, uh, Chimunk list. Mm-hmm. And um, so we shot that day. Um, I also got to meet this woman who was a PA who went on to be a producer for Natural Born Killers. Mm-hmm. Um, Jane, I forget her last name. But I got home, and David called me. Or the next day, the David called me and said, you had the people in the dailies, like, busting their you know, busting their gut, just from my reaction, you know, because I was just watching them go back and forth. And so those were like, you know, um, little, you know, real, nice little nuggets that even though it was just one little thing, when there's someone in your corner and someone who believes in you, and you know, I remember they, like Danny said, just keep going, it's going to happen for you. And you know, it didn't. I had a lot of near misses. I got really close to a lot of things, and I never quite made it over the hump. I mean, there were years when I did make a living at it, but that's, that's what it used to be back in the 80s and 90s and even the early aughts before the proliferation of cable. Mm-hmm. You could make a decent living in TV and film, and you would get enough residuals to have to be a working actor. Right. And now that it's gone to internet and streaming, and, um, you know, we've just seen this with vertical integration, and um, all the money is going to the people at the top. And yes. the the... the the rank and file working actor has disappeared. It's the same way with the middle class in America. You know, everything is going 
to corporations. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so that's one of the reasons why, like this, this job I did for Universal, did Jurassic World, I had a blast. Mm-hmm. And you know, I was first on the call sheet for like multiple days until the stars were there. And the director let me, the program, the, the, um, the Universal Theme Park producer loved me. The director, they all adored me, and I had such a great time, and I got to work with Chris again and Bryce, and it was just really, really fun, and I felt so validated. Like, I had such a great time. And then the third-party payroll refused to pay the actors. It was a triple-scale deal, and they would not honor the contract, and we all ended up in a class action suit, and the guild could not put pressure on them to get it done. And I finally, I got the email addresses of that president and legal counsel. And they're like, well, we're going to need more information. And it was like, it had been a year. And then the director who was English, this had been gone for a year. And he came back and he texted me. He's like, Hey, how's it going? I'm like, you know, I haven't been, I haven't been paid. And he's like, what? So the director called the production, his production company, the production company called mm-hmm. the third party payroll and said, knock it off and pay them. So it was not the guild, um, and it wasn't universal. It was a third-party payroll refused to honor the contract basis. And my agent said, this is the way it's getting, is you have to sue to get your money. And at that point, I was like, you know, I'm teaching full-time. I, I've made more connections as a writer. I, I, I did a really great work for hire as a writer for Sony last year. Um, but I just thought, I, I don't think I want to do this anymore. Yeah, that's a yeah. fucked up thing to say. By the way, you have to sue in order to yeah. get your money now. Oh, like it's a it's like yeah. it's a trend, you know? God, that's awful. Yeah, you, yeah. You did uh, two. So, oh, go ahead. I mean, I, I you know those directors I work with who I like, and if they were ever you know requested me, sure. But I, mm-hmm. I'm, you know, that's that's the thing about you know human nature and maturing is like your desire change, your goals change, where you find your creativity changes. And also, you know, I'm just, I'm not, you know, in my 20s and 30s, the hero, or I always play character people. Yeah. But, um, you know, unless I were hired to come in in some NCIS and just play, you know, the medical examiner was like, yeah, she's got a stick in her eye, you know, like yeah. some <laughs> friend, something like that. I mean, I, I really, I love what I'm doing. I basically run a writer's room full time, you know, as a teacher. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You did um, two episodes of Quantum Leap. How was that? Yes, I did. <laughs> um, that, that's another thing where they were just beautiful. Wonder Scott Bakula was just such a just a classic, class act, class act. He, you know, with every every uh, episode, he would go and introduce himself to the cast. And so when he's like, "Oh, you're back," you know, he was just such a kind, kind, kind person. It was a director. He was the same director as both episodes. Um, and it's just really, really fun. And plus, this is interesting. In The Last Gunfighter, um, the guy who's sort of the bad guy, the gunslinger, and they have the shootout at the mm-hmm. end, that actor played the bad guy in that famous Gunsmoke episode where there was a shootout and that for years to come, film schools would buy that footage, all the dailies, and that would be the editing assignment, is you had to take those dailies and you had to edit the footage. Mm-hmm. And so when he showed up, I'm like, hey, you're the bad guy in the Gunsmoke edit. Yeah. You know? <laughs> I mean, then they moved on to Hawaii Five-0. But for years and years, like, you know, um, the production company or the, would sell, you know, you know, 16 millimeter copies of that footage, and you had to edit it. But it was the same guy, and it was the last thing he shot. He was he was quite old by then, and and he passed away that next year. But I got to work with him, and that was really really fun. That's not uh, Rance Howard, no. Um, let me see. Because he was in he was in one of the episodes you were in. Let me see. Um. Oh, the last gunfighter um, episode. Okay, here it is. Yeah. Let's see. It was, let's see. John Anderson? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow, that's going way back. <laughs> yeah, that, well, he was, I mean, he must have been, 
um, in his 70s, pushing 80. Um, you know, I don't know when, how old he was, but it was the last thing he ever did. Yeah. There, there's a podcast um, dedicated to Quantum Leap, and they've been having like guest stars from the show come on mm -hmm. for interviews and stuff. Uh, have you been approached by them? They haven't, but you know they did have a Quantum Leap, um, like they had a fan, you know, festival yeah. kind of thing where you know this was <coughs> uh, <coughs> maybe ten years ago, uh -huh. or fifteen years ago. Um, that have, you know, and, and so I had been invited to those things, and there was an anniversary thing I was invited to. Um, I mean, I don't know how people are compared. I watched a couple of the new episodes, mm -hmm. and I just, that kind of network TV just is not my thing. I don't. No. Yeah, it, it, I, I don't. Yeah, it doesn't, it, it doesn't exist. It doesn't ex yeah, it doesn't exist anymore, you know. Then, of course, you did the classic hot tub episode of Seinfeld. That must have been a lot of laughs on set. That was, well, the funny thing about that is, you know, say as an actor, you have to sort of psych yourself up. To, like, don't put the pressure on yourself. You know, that's why the more auditions you go on, the better you're at, because it's like you lose one game in a football season, you're not going to go to the Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. But if you lose one game in the baseball season, you know, you still have very, you know, just there's 162 games in a season of baseball. Um, and so the more auditions... And I was in graduate school getting my degree, my master's in screenwriting when I auditioned for that. And there were a lot of things that I auditioned for while I was in graduate school. And I booked the job because I walked in like, yeah, you know, I've got places to go. Um, you know, so it was just my attitude. I just enjoyed myself. Um, Larry David was great. And you know, up until that point, because I wasn't really a big TV watcher, mm -hmm. I watched some episodes of Seinfeld. I'm like, eh, you know, you yeah. know about nothing. And, <laughs> and Jerry Seinfeld isn't really in his character. You never believe like he's really invested or really that sincere about anything. But yeah. I was like a little hoity twitty attitude. Well, like the other actors felt like they were really imbibing those characters, but Jerry Fine so I felt like felt like he was standing outside of himself commenting on his character. But when I was mm -hmm. on the set and I watched Larry and Jerry sit and dissect a scene and how the rhythm or how like how things should land and just the rhythm of the dialogue, they blew mm -hmm. my mind. I was like, they are geniuses. Like Jerry absolutely understands comedy. And yeah. my respect for him, I, you know, ever since then, I've just had, like, massive respect for him. Because I saw, like, how how well they understood the way that comedy works. Oh, yeah. And um, and they're all really nice. And Jason Alexander, you know, he came out of Broadway theater. Mm -hmm. And in that episode, the guys who were basically the guys, um, the cronies from Yankee Stadium were the ones who were, like, you know, the bastard and all that. Like, they were all old Broadway act, you know, you know, New York Broadway actors, and so all week there was a picnic table inside the um, the um, soundstage, and they just sat around and talked stories. And so that was the fun place to be. Is like go sit down on the picnic bench and just listen to them talk about their New York theater stories. It was really fun. Oh, that that does sound cool. Yeah, you were on um, one of the last episodes of Married with Children. How was that? Um. I did two episodes. Um, one episode, I forget the name of the, um, the the wife who has a gay cousin. I basically played her body double, you know, when they were, like, having to shoot over her shoulder. Okay. And that was, like, having the character come out gay, that was, like... Um, you know, the director was kind of a dick. Okay. <laughs> um, sorry. He was... Yeah, he was kind of a jerk. And... Um, why am I blanking on his name? He's from Modern Family. Jerry um, Cohen? Yeah, he was just like, don't talk to her like that. It was great. Oh, Ed O'Neill? All fun, the actors were great. Yeah, Ed O'Neill. Mm -hmm. They were all great. But the director was, was unkind. And Ed O'Neill just was like, said to the, and you know, directors are journeymen. Unless you get like Jim Burroughs, who's like, a favorite and basically feels like part of the furniture. Mm -hmm. well, you know, in television, it may have changed a lot now, but back then it was like the writer-producer is king. Mm -hmm. 
they're the ones who make the decision. And then you get guest directors, and the guest director is lucky to be there and does what you're told, whatever. And this guy, I think, um, I think I remember his name, but I'm not going to repeat it. Okay. Um, he was just, he talked down to me, and he was rude. And Ed O'Neill was like, you don't need to, you don't need to do that. And he, and he stopped. And I was like, I'm just nobody. And, and he just, um, I think it may have been on the episode. It was a close set. We didn't have a live audience, the one where, so it was just the main cast. And I was there to, you know, because they liked me, that I worked me and know that I could give them good comic timing. And I could, in a wig, look like that other character and pass for that and give them something to play off of. I think it was that, that was that, that the guy was just, he was unkind and, and treated me like a second class person. And Ed O'Neill was like, knock it off. Yeah. Oh, that's that's awful. Sorry you had that experience. It's my favorite sitcom of all well, time. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, and, but you know what? But you look at the cast, and they they work so well together. They respect. They they treat each other well. You know, and mm-hmm. they know how to play off of each other. And that's why you know it was such a success. Such a success. Absolutely. I saw your I saw your demo reel on YouTube, and I saw some stuff on there I had never seen. Uh, you were you did this movie called Made Men, and uh, you and Timothy Dalton. Oh right. In that scene, yeah. yeah. How was how was doing that? Well, we were we were in uh, Utah for six weeks, mm-hmm. um, and that was and I was finishing graduate school, so when I wasn't on set, I was in my hotel room working on my thesis script which is really fun. And um, um, it was a really interesting lesson because I wasn't that significant of a role. I mean, it was there long enough. I think I had, was booked like, in a way, it was cheaper to just keep me at the hotel than to fly me home and then fly me back again. Um, but uh, it was one of the first ADs, you know, when I wrapped, he's like, it's really great working with you. I'm like, I haven't done that much. He's like, no, you, no, you're... Mm-hmm. I guess the vibe is when there are people who are difficult to work with or there's divas, you know, how you are on the set, regardless of how big your role is, like you show up, you let people know where you're going, you know, you, when you take off your wardrobe, you hang it up, you know, just throw it around. Like Mm -hmm. just little things in, in terms of that will make you somebody that people like working with. Um, and it's not just what you say, but just what you don't say and how you are, um, that makes people want to work with you again. Right. And, but that's one of the things, I mean, I had a lot of fun cause I got to like, I was just playing this white trash person who was like having an affair with some of the adult, which is hilarious. It's like, you know, the, I'm, I'm, you know, having a fling with James Bond. Um, <laughs> but that, that was really fun, and also, that was also really fun is that I felt the permission to, like, feel like, oh, yeah, like, I'm a star, too, not like, oh, I just need to cower here and give you straight lines, you know, it was a really fun vibe, um, and Jim Belushi, you know, she was just really fun, but um, I think the lesson that I came away with is, like, you don't realize how you are um, to ev- you know, treat everyone around you kindly um, and and be responsible. Um, you know, it's just really important. Yeah. Did you work with v- Vanessa Angel? Um, I don't think I did. Yeah, I remember that name, but no, oh. it was just Timothy. Oh, okay, I've talked to her. Today's her birthday. Happy birthday, Vanessa! Oh, <laughs> happy birthday, Vanessa! And I saw on there too the uh, "My Name Is Earl" episode, <laughs> where you know he's he, he's like, "Are you drunk enough to go home with me?" You take a couple more sips. Yep. <laughs> yep. Oh, that was a blast. Yeah, that was really that was really really fun. <laughs> it was really fun. That was another one where the director. Interesting because one of the writer producers on that show is now my um, colleague mm-hmm. at Chapman. We both teach teach writing classes there. Yeah. And Greg Garcia. I mean, I loved um, his shows. He's just, you know, that and always the, oh, Raising Hope. You know, that was just really, really, really fun. And the woman, you know, my the barfly girl there with me, she really did have only one leg. Really? 
she was a dancer and she got some kind of cancer and had to have oh. um yeah so you know they went through the real thing wow that's crazy yeah yeah you wrote a movie called rideshare what's the genesis behind that um, this is when the iPhone 4 came out, and Donovan Cook, he's a t- uh, TV director, he does a lot of uh, Disney, play, uh, um, Disney, you know, uh, mm. television, um, kids' television, he came out of CalArts. He wanted to do um, a movie on the iPhone, be the first one to do it, until it was largely improvised, so mm-hmm. he sort of came up with storylines, and then the whole thing is improvised, and Donovan was great. I mean, it was... Um, <coughs> You know, it was a it was a great experiment. I think um, there were some things with the storyline. We also had a really you know really low budget, really quick turnaround, and I think there were some storylines that didn't quite work out. That things that were set up that weren't paid were quite paid off correctly, and vice versa. But it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. But it was literally this micro budget shot on an iPhone. Um, and we did some scenes um, in L.A., and then basically we had, like, uh, an eight-day road trip where we had to go to these certain places, film things on the down low, and get out of there. Wow. It was really fun. I need to see that movie. I'm sure I'd like it. It's definitely, and you can see where, like, I mean, Mike Lee, who does a lot of his movies in that way, he will shoot hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of footage and then find the story. And he's got the time, and he's OCD, and he has plenty of money, and he can do that. Um, I think that was the, the idea behind it. Nice. Uh, you mentioned before uh, your one-woman show, what was it Angry Conversations mm-hmm. with God, it was called, right? I saw the mm-hmm. um, I saw the clip of you describing um, how hearts are like donuts. I was cracking up at that. That was so clever. <laughs> Oh, God. I mean, I mean, I just felt like I got, you know, growing up um, in, I think, like, Lutheran, the Lutheran church feels pretty sane compared to kind of the stuff that I went through every weird iteration. It definitely had, like, the rock and roll slackers for Jesus church with the pa- with the surfer pastors. Like, there's a big denomination where the, it was founded by a guy who was a surfer and played drums in a, you know, a cover band. I mean, like, that's the depth of theology behind some of these places. I look back and like, I can't believe I went through that. But I did. I mean, he didn't say that. I made that up. But, but that that's the kind of, <laughs> you know, that's the kind of analogies we get. Yeah. yeah. Do you ever get mistaken for the Susan Isaacs who wrote Uncompromising Positions? Oh, yeah. Um, this is back, gosh, in the late 80s. I was mm. out of college, and um, someone from Entertainment Weekly called me at my home number. It's like, we'd like to talk to you about women's roles in films. I'm like, I'd be glad to tell talk to you about that. But <laughs> I don't think I'm the one you're looking for. Um, another time, Shane Black, I think he had, one, there was a woman named Susie Isaacs, so it was Sue Isaacs, so I think was an agent for a while, and Shane accidentally called me, and I was like, I'm not that Sue Isaacs, but we went to UCLA together, and we had, you know, talked on the phone for, it's kind of funny, I like, had this, like, 45-minute conversation with Shane Black over a mistaken number. And also, um, I did, when email came up, uh, I started getting email, and uh, Susan Isaacs, the real Susan Isaacs, um, we got in touch with each other, and she's, uh, like, Pauline Kale had sent her, um, you have a, you are in plenty of strains and automobiles? She's like, no. <laughs> um, and so... I met her when I, I lived in New York for about five years and she was doing a book signing and I went to see her so we met each other. So we'll, we'll be in touch with her frequently. I'm like, hey, hey, guess what? Paramount wants the rights to your book. And she's like, oh, awesome. So, yes, I've met her. Yeah. She's, she's delightful. She's such a smart woman. She's incredibly prolific, smart, uh, prolific novelist, great writer, this wonderful lady. Yes, she's a very talented writer. So... Yeah. When you teach, uh, do you get a satisfaction teaching that you don't get when you're actually acting? Yeah, I mean, it is um, a different muscle. I think the thing that I eventually learned when I go back, when I go back to when I was at theater school and how much I did not like 
like trying to come up with a character and invent this thing in my head and walk around in their body and decide what kind of food they ate and be in that moment in a black box and all of that. It's exhausting and it's not the thing that made me that made me come alive. Um, um, creating my own material like Groundlings and coming up with new stuff and especially writing comedy and performing it. I re- came to realize that I, I love communicating my own story. I'm not, like, that's the thing that makes me really happy doing. And, um, um, you know, doing this rewrite for Sony last year was great. I love doing my own solo show because it's the story that's very specific to me. Um, and that, I get a lot of that. Or being, being a storyteller, whether that's on a page or in a, a screenplay or in an essay, um, I really love that, and I really love performing. And I, and you know, I'm basically as a professor, I'm doing a three-hour stand-up act. You know, I'm like I'm engaging them, and in, in you know, entwining them into the story. And it's I also love directing theater and, and sketch comedy. Uh, the college where I used to teach at Azusa Pacific University. Right. I I started a sketch comedy class where. It was cross listed with theater and film, and all the film writers had to act, and all the theater actors had to write. And we put on a show at the end of the semester, and it was one of the most popular things at that school. And getting them to find their voice, and watching these shy people come out of their shell, you know, discover that, you know, just the thrill of creating a material and having people respond to it, it's a different. I had an analogy in my book that um, I felt like, you know, I was really frustrated because I felt like God had, had made me to play a certain note and I wasn't getting to play it, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but I came to realize, you know, there are a lot, there's not just one string on a guitar. There are six or a 12 string guitar, there's 12 strings. That um, I really, really love teaching because I'm basically a full-time script doctor. doctor. Mm-hmm. You know, I get... Um, anywhere between 30 and 45, you know, thesis projects a year that I have to help them go from, you know, log line to finished script and creating a writer's room that has the same kind of encouraging energy that Bob Van Holt and Mindy Sterling would create. Um, not just saying, hey, everything's groovy, but uh, I'm a firm believer in you, you know, shitty first draft. Just, uh, you have to stop being precious, allow yourself to write the shitty first draft, because the hardest thing is just getting it on the page. Right. And yes, you may, you may have exposition-heavy material. You may have dialogue that's on the nose. It's your first draft. It's a placeholder until you come up with something else. And it's great to, for me to watch the student be forced to learn that, and then when their stories start talking to them or their characters start talking to them, and the story starts telling them what it is, and they and they go with it. It's also wonderful to watch new writers emerge and see them, especially if they're really overly serious and, and put a lot of pressure on themselves, to see them relax and start to enjoy the process and recognize. Uh, I, ha- I do an exercise. This is something I learned when I was at UNC from Frank Danielle, who started the screenwriting program at UNC, and say, whenever you start a story, Write a letter to yourself about everything you love about it, why you're excited about it. Put it in all the notes, put it in your desk. And when the time comes that you hate your story, because it will come, take it out and read it. And I, ha- I have my students do that. Because you will always come to hate it. Right. It's just, it's, you know, sometimes it happens early, sometimes it happens late. And I just say, that's okay, that's okay. Um, there's things that aren't working. You write forward, make notes, write forward. And it may work itself out by the time you get there. So why, why be stuck if you know where the story needs to go next? If, if, you're, if it's keeping you from moving forward, just write a little note to yourself even if in the draft of the script. This is the part where I'm stuck and I need to somehow get to this point right here and I'm going to write forward. Is if I fix that, write forward. So many yeah. things work them out through the process of writing. They don't work them out with you. I mean, there's a lot of writing is thinking about, yes. Yeah. But um, it's much, um, there's an old adage, God can't steer a parked car. 
I, I feel that like with a story. If you haven't written it, it, you know, you have got to get it on the page. Yeah, I've been working it's on my... It's a great book. Mm-hmm. Go ahead. It's a book I, I recommend to my students second semester. It's Jack Epps. Uh, screenwriting is rewriting. It's a really great book. That's a good title. <laughs> yeah, because all, all writing is rewriting, actually. I think if anyone's listening to this and wants to be um, a, a writer, I think the thing you just have to allow yourself is that Think of the first draft as you're constructing a house and you're just putting up the rebar mm-hmm. and, uh, and the wood frame. If you're pissed off that it doesn't look like a mansion, that's because it's not yet. And no, you're not going to write. It's not going to be Oscar-worthy in the first draft. It's just not. You have to be willing to, you know, I'm working on a script right now with my writing partner. It's our seventh draft. It's getting better every time. You know, it just you have to be willing to do it. And you have to be willing. You're going to get old. Any your days and years are going to go by anyway. You might as well have them go by doing the thing that you want to do. Yes, and take notes because the mind plays tricks on you. <laughs> yeah, I've been. Yeah. Um, um, I've been working on my memoir on and off for the last year, you know, and so like every time right. a story from my past comes up in my brain, I got to write it down because I know I'm going to forget it. <laughs> I have my students do is if they're trying to write and they get distracted, just keep a notepad um, and write down like a bullet list of the things that come up. There's a thing with the brain that this is also good if you have insomnia. Whatever ideas are floating around that, if you write it down, there's a kinetic transformation, uh, transaction of the energy that goes out of your hand and onto the page and, and helps leave your, leave your mind. I also uh, start every class with a Free, free writing, you know, freehand writing warm up, just so that they jump out. I'll have a series of prompts and questions that I'll ask them and get them going. Because um, it's really easy if you try to compose, and this is for you know learning how to write a computer as well. Right. There's something about writing freehand that a um, it, you, you're not thinking about margins or grammar or spelling or punctuation or this dialogue went on too long. You're just <laughs> in your creative id. And it's one way to get around the editor and the critic. Very well said, Susan. Do you have any upcoming projects you'd like to mention? Um, well, I don't know when it's going to come out, but the movie I did a rewrite for called Sun Moon. And it's a, kind of a comedy drama about a woman who got left at the altar, so she runs off to Taiwan to escape her grief and, and teach English as a second language, but of course she can't escape her grief. Right. So that's coming up. I'm really excited about that. Um, so yeah, you can look for that. And it, and it'll pro- I don't know if it's going to go straight to video, if they're going to have a, you know, these days, you know, movie premieres in the theaters so have become more of a rare thing. It might just end up, you know, a streaming premiere. I don't know. But it's called Sun Moon, and it's really fun. Sun Moon, awesome. Maybe you can come back on and talk about it when it comes out. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I'd I'd love to. Awesome. I have a joke for you. Um, What do you call a boy that doesn't masturbate? Dead? A liar. (laughs) (laughs) Susan, thank you so much for coming on and sharing all these great stories. Uh, I hope you have a happy Thanksgiving and the rest of the holidays. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Yes. Be safe out there. You too. Thank you. Mm Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, there you have it. Susan Isaacs. Ain't she a sweetheart? Oh, nice lady. Great stories there. A lot of energy. I enjoy talking to her. Well, until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying... There's no shame in living in the past, because the present sucks. Later, dudes.